Dentistry Today is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year, and to commemorate the occasion, we're interviewing some of the profession's most influential clinicians, looking back on the past four decades and ahead into the future. Today, we're talking with Dr. L. Stephen Buchanan, an endodontist in private practice and an assistant clinical professor in endodontics at the University of Southern California and UCLA. He also is one of Dentistry Today's leaders in continuing education and one of our most popular and prolific contributors. Dr. Buchanan, thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure, Rich. Um, it's been a great relationship with your uh, publication, and I, we can get into it later in the questions, but I think uh, you've made a huge contribution to dentistry's field. Well, well nice thank to be you a part for that. that. <laughs> we, we couldn't do it without uh, clinicians like you providing us with um, great articles to read each month and your perspective. Um, and speaking of that perspective, just looking back at dentistry in general over the course of your career, what have been some of the biggest changes that you've seen? Um, the most fundamental answer is, that we don't really appreciate is that clinical care is so much better. I've been around long enough, you know, 40 years is a long time, kind of get slips past you. But what we patients now is, is unbelievable, more consistently ideal last longer all the materials are biocompatible it's it's been amazing i think dentistry is a a huge success story as a field okay and uh, what are some of the reasons behind those improvements in clinical care is it just better technology better training better awareness among the population where does that improvement come well right um so two procedures and concepts develop together concepts mm -hmm. usually lead and then we try different things out clinically, and then if we find some success or we're, we're constantly frustrated, then we think we need a new tool. So um, they go together. I think it's all fascinating. I think uh, the conceptual side of endodontics is a lot of inter is a lot of fun because you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So it's all what you're imagining in your head. It's three dimensional imaging, and uh, then you go test your hypothesis in somebody's tooth and see what happens. <laughs> okay. You learn a lot that way. Mm -hmm. And speaking of endodontics, and what have been some of the biggest changes for that particular specialty? Oh my God! Every single thing clinically is different. The only thing that stayed the same is the anatomy. Mm -hmm. But with that said, uh, so I mean, we have microscopes, but that's not as huge a difference from really nice loops. Uh, the biggest ones is the digitation of endodontics by combing CT imaging, and uh, absolutely changed the whole specialty. If, if I had to give you my microscope or my CT machine, I'd give you my microscope and buy some new loops <laughs> because you can't see the hidden view on a microscope you can in a CT. Can you walk us through maybe um, some of your own experience with CBCT machines and how they've changed how you've been able to provide treatment Absolutely. for your patients? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, my friend Roger Warren made this observation. He said, it's like it happened in medicine when CT and MRI came. They used to have stables of exposed surgeons. So you come in with a gut ache, nobody knows what's going on. They're gonna zip you open and take a look. Mm -hmm. They don't do that anymore because they can image you and most everything except trauma is a procedure, even if it's a, a critical need. In, in endo, we used to do exploratory accesses all the time. Wasted our time. We lost money on locations because you can't charge somebody for a two hour slot that you find out in 45 that's too solely unsavable. So now we know that beforehand. We have, uh, I think our, our prognoses, predictions are way more accurate because of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and CBCT is such um, a, a huge technology, such a game changer, but it's also big and expensive. Um, how do dental practices and endodontic practices absorb those costs and also just learn how to use the new gear? Right, well, learning how to new, use the new gear, that's a bit of a challenge the, the companies uh, some of them train than others, but um, I'd recommend getting in touch with Bruno Acevedo, uh, the cone beam guy, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's uh, he, the University of Kentucky, awesome guy, uh, one of the smartest uh, dental radiologists I've ever met, mm -hmm. and he will take you through, he's got a whole bunch of online uh, courses that will really help. So to buy a machine this much money and not avail yourself of the training to really take advantage of it is a missed opportunity. In terms of the cost of it, it's a big price tag, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. but mine has made me money every month I've had it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a car. It's a, it's, it's a profit center. As an endodontist, once I incorporate CBCT imaging for all my patients, which is still controversial, not, not so much as it was before, but um, as soon as I started doing that, I started seeing all these diagnosed uh, areas of disease in other parts of their jaws that they didn't know about. Um, and, and so the joke is you, you can't tell if a patient needs a CBC unless you take one, look at it, and then you'll know. So we take them on all patients. If they can't afford it, I'm going to give it free because I can't do a job without it. Also, as an endodontist, nobody wants to pay you for an opinion on a diagnosis, but your opinion, your treatment relation, and the prognosis determination is the most valuable thing we do. It's more valuable than what we do. Mm -hmm. And so being able to charge for comb CT actually – Everybody, two hundred fifty dollars, very fair fee for that, and that means I make money on my diagnosis now. It's not law; it's not a loss leader for the rest of my practice. Okay, that's important to be paid for their time because the worst cases, I mean, some of these things take an hour to figure out what's going on, mm -hmm. and without home MCT, it'd be heinous. Okay, so um, it definitely has improved efficiency, improved, uh, streamlined a lot of care. But what other digital technologies have had um, a significant impact on endodontics? My, my favorite um, comes uh, spring, springboards off of Comb MCT, mm -hmm. and that's dynamic guidance. I spent six years trying to figure out how to make static drill guides from implant surgery work for endo. And it, it's finally realized it's impossible because the drills are too long. You can't fit them in between teeth. The implants, mm -hmm. we don't have a tooth there. So the 10 millimeter space is easily taken up. <laughs> so I had given up until I saw XNAP, mm -hmm. an overhead 3D camera system that watches a fairy on my handpiece and a fairy drum, a little Q code drum on either attached to my jaw with a registration device attached to their teeth on the opposite side that I'm gonna treat. Once I have that data gathered with the, the, uh, with the, uh, the fiduciary clip, program my drill paths, set it off, and then uh, it comes up like a video game. There's a little target comes up as soon as I get near it, it zooms up, it tells me if it's seeing all my, my uh, scanning uh, drums well enough, or it starts blinking, and I can drill Two thirds of the way up of a lateral incisor root and hit a canal like just as far three millimeters from the other root canal within a half or a quarter millimeter accuracy. So that has taken the worst cases we ever get referred, which are calcified, and made them kind of like a fun video game. Okay, and uh, speaking of root canals, and that's basically what endodontists are most well known for among the general public. Um, I've had a couple myself, unfortunately. But I have excellent. <laughs> How is root canal? Excellent. <laughs> well, you know, unfortunately for me, I had to have the pain at first, but overall things have been better. But um, how has uh, root canal treatment specifically evolved over the course of, of your career? Uh, well, as I said before, all the tools are different. The procedures are two. When I got into uh, the specialty, most of what we were doing in the actual procedure of root canal was about instruments and like mm -hmm. serial step back instrumentation. We had 12 to 18 instruments and like 50 or 60 little steps. Mm -hmm. Today we use one or two rotary files and it's a better shape than we had before. That's pretty good. It's more conservative. It's more regular. We don't have to overshape to have the resistance form we need. That's fantastic. And also with bioceramic sealers today, we can just cement a cone into a root canal and fill any of the lateral canals that we've cleaned out by capillarity. And that's a pretty wild thing. Okay, so are, are, are you seeing better responses from patients? Are they uh, more satisfied or are they less afraid to come in for these treatments? They're still just as afraid. That's why <laughs> God, that's why God invented Xanax, okay? Um, but uh, but, but what, what do they get out of the instrumentation of revolution? They get a root canal half the time. Mm -hmm. What do they get with uh, the change in the bioceramic sealers that improves and simplifies our obturation method? Uh, you know, they get a single visit because mm -hmm. the dentist can finish the case off and everybody's happier when you get it done a single visit. Okay. And it also improves on um, the effectiveness. There's no, there's not as much need to come back later for retreatment or follow-ups or things like that. It's always better if you do the whole job while you're in there the first time, right? Okay. And the old joke, uh, make sure if you don't aren't successful that 
you don't fix it so nobody else can fix it. <laughs> okay, and, and what alternatives have emerged to a root canal or, or some other common treatments that, that you commonly practice? Well, I'm proud of our specialty um, because we've done a lot of work on uh, pulp regeneration. Uh, mm -hmm. The most important time that we accomplish this is in anterior teeth for kids that are immature and they have little thin roots. We can regenerate a pulp in there, possibly thicken the root structure up, um, then they'll have a serviceable tooth the rest of their life. So regeneration of pulps, is that practical in a molar? No, doing the regeneration work would be take longer than doing the root canal work and it wouldn't be as predictable. So all new technologies find their niche and their place. They usually don't replace other things. They give us a, a better toolkit to pull out um, and help our patients. And, that, and regeneration is a, is a great one. Okay, and we're also starting to see more general dentists starting to take up endodontic treatment. Um, what's driving this trend and what impact is that going to have on care? Okay, so for the life of the AAE, 80% of the root canals have been done by GPs. Mm -hmm. There's an up and down, everything's a sine wave. <clears throat> and what makes it go down? Mm -hmm. Like everybody wants to have full mouth uh, uh, onlays and veneers. Well, they don't have time to do root canals. They're going to refer them all out. When 2009 hits, all mm -hmm. of a sudden they start having t general dentists taking courses about doing root canals because they don't have a lot of elective uh, procedures coming in. And that's occurred, obviously, during the COVID process as well. So it goes up and down. Right now, there's a lot of general dentists interested on doing a better root canal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're stuffed. Our uh, DE uh, labs training facilities booked to August, I think. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about um, your continuing education program, Dental Education Laboratories, and, and yeah. how it has evolved? Thank you for asking. Um, there's some confusion. Some people uh, occasionally think it's a dental laboratory where they make crowns and stuff. It's an educational laboratory. And the reason I named it that, even though it's a little obscure, is um, I come from a family of teachers, and I'm fascinated by the way that humans learn new things. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, not just taught courses, we have developed methods of teaching courses that I think has improved continuing education. The biggest one, 3D printed replicas of teeth and jaws. Uh, endodontists can now learn how to do endodontic surgery and do 10 surgeries on one set of jaws. And there's lesions up there, they can incise, reflect the rubber gum tissues, find a lesion, put a retro seal in the canal that's in every one of the roots there. It's, it's kind of magical. What it's mostly done is it's allowed us to choose the anatomy for the training exercise so we're much better focused and also for the first time in endodontics we can train people iteratively. Uh, until then it's been an extracted tooth, you give it a try and if that thing doesn't work, you, you don't get a mulligan. Mm -hmm. if with a replica, you can do it 19 times and fudge it and if you get it the 20th time, you actually then kind of own the, the skill set. So that's really fun. And I see people uh, learning at a faster rate because the replicas. Also, uh, the lab doesn't smell like burning chicken feathers because the extracted <laughs> tooth does. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. So, so the use of uh, these um, synthetic materials, 3D printing, and, and things like that, uh, they've, been able, they've enabled you to ha provide um, more hands-on kinds of training? Yes, not only more, a better hands-on in uh, my training lab, but we just started offering remote hands-on training. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the blessings of COVID is we all have learned how to Zoom, how mm -hmm. often we can. We're gonna make different decisions about whether we're gonna do this meeting from home or the office. I think that's all fabulous. Um, and uh, online education is huge. I don't think somebody, I personally don't like sitting in a lecture hall listening to somebody lecture because it's either too slow or too fast. If it's too fast and I'm fascinated, I can't take notes quick enough. Um, I prefer to watch it at my speed. So I like, I like uh, uh, digital content. Mm -hmm. And then I want to have more of a live experience with the hands-on part. The limitation of hands-on has always been, I got to be there because I don't know what anatomy you have in your hand. Now that I control it, we, we have a kit for access procedures that is uh, like 16 credits. There's 18 replicas. There's, uh, I think, about four hours of interactive video to lead people through doing access on the interior premolars and molars. Mm -hmm. And then you send them in to us and we grade them and send it back to you. So that right there is going to save people, could save them $10,000 of lost uh, production that mm -hmm. would normally happen when they have to fly to Santa Barbara to take my course. Okay. So that's, I think that's, I think that's a real contribution. 
And are you seeing positive feedback from the people taking your courses, especially now that we're interacting more or less remotely most of the time? Yes, um, and we are, we're, like I said, we're booked till August. We didn't give any courses for nine months just because, well, we had other things to do. We, we went into creative mode. That's when we created the remote, remote hands-on access course. It's uh, got the irrigation device that we're gonna be launching this summer, um, fully developed in a remarkably short period of time. So it didn't, pra didn't teach, didn't practice, but now it's really nice to be back in the saddle. I missed it. And part of your um, educational efforts aren't just your coursework, but also writing for Dentistry Today and other publications. Can you walk us through um, what that process is like? What inspires you to, when you see a case or a technique to say, ah, this is something I need to share with the community? Well, if it's new and it works, mm -hmm. that, that qualifies. <laughs> and, okay. And it probably it needs to be in endodontics because I'm not an expert in other things. But um, I think the most important thing, let me back up and say, um, the gratitude that dentistry owes dentistry today is large because before you guys came on the scene, we had product reviews, we had catalogs, but we didn't have anybody like that who could mix the two and bring brand new procedural descriptions uh, to a dentist in a time frame that uh, is like a tenth of the time for a peer review. Mm -hmm. So some things don't need peer review. You try it, it works or it doesn't work. You don't need 29 randomized clinical trials to figure out that composite won't stick. <laughs> so okay. um, so having this shorter uh, time loop to get procedural details out there changed change dentistry, certainly changed endodontics. I know I know most endodontists like who's writing the endo article this month, I gotta check it out. You need to get halfway through it and go, ah, or you're gonna read the whole thing and go, holy smoke. But um, you guys are super relevant. Well, well, thank you for that. And, and I could say that um, our endodontics articles, um, not just because it's an important specialty on its own, but again, because more general practitioners are taking an interest in it currently, um, that uh, they do turn out to be some of our, our most uh, popular and most well-read articles issue to issue. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But um, on top of that, though, you were talking about uh, how the pandemic shut down many of your classes, uh, shut down some of your practices as well. Um, when people just couldn't get to the dentist for emergency, for that routine care, the emergencies started to build up. How did you see those effects play out in your own practice? We saw, we saw patients in pain all the way through the, the epidemic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I have a lot of friends in, the, in dentistry, both uh, in North America and Europe, who practiced gangbusters every single day through the mm -hmm. whole COVID crisis. I'm in Santa Barbara. We have eight endodontists for 100,000 people, so uh -huh. we don't. We're not lacking endodontists, and so um, really, we just saw the patients that needed elective procedures. Most people were too afraid to have anything that they didn't need. The hospitals were not doing elective procedures anyway. Um, but as much as that put everything in a, in a, a standstill or chokehold, I, I think it's going to be going back. We're going to see a very nice recovery. I think you know, all the patients that have had not had their teeth cleaned. They're going to be dying to get back in. We're going to have dentistry take off and probably surpass what it was shortly before the, the recovery or the, the pandemic. Okay. And also, um, just in the way that um, dentists and endodontists provided care during the pandemic in terms of uh, PPE, in, in terms of mm -hmm. trying to be efficient, um, how do you see these changes impacting the way you act after the pandemic is, is over? Right. Right. Well, again, I was proud of our, our field. Um, we really kind of went through this whole thing during the AIDS and the, the Hep C uh, mm -hmm. pandemics. And uh, I mean, it's easier to die from Hep C than it is from this virus. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're really good at infection control. We've been doing that for 20 years. So this was really like not that big of a deal. The only thing that changed was like, okay, more awareness about aerosols. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, get a new suction system and, or a new system if they can't get that big <laughs> suction thing nearby you. It's, it's, I don't think it's going to be a whole lot different. Let me put it that way. So, and I think it's a positive thing. I think we learned a huge amount. Of, the whole world of humans learned a lot about infectious diseases, and that was really helpful. Um, I've never seen airplanes clean before. That's a new one. <laughs> they were like a slimy. Ugh, God, you have no idea. Don't ever lift a cushion up and look under there for your wallet. But um, they're now clean. It's like okay. oh. Well, well are, are you seeing patients coming in 
being more aware of infection control and aerosols and things that they need to know about to possibly take better care of themselves and their oral health? We talk about it. Any, you know, anything that anything they have as a question, for sure. Um, my patients in older populations, so they have a lot of this information already. Mm -hmm. So we don't really spend a lot of time on it. Also, my older pa patient population, they've all been vaccinated. Okay. Yeah. Well, well yeah. I, that's very good to hear that uh, it, it's making its way across the country then. Yes, only Marin County will be unvaccinated uh, by the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, a couple of more things then. Um, are you seeing any other trends or influences today that are going to have an impact on care moving ahead into the future? Um, if we look back over the last 20, 30 years mm -hmm. as to what was the most fundamental thing, we talk about procedures and tools and all that, but material science mm -hmm. is what's really changed more than anything else. We wouldn't have implants. We wouldn't have perf repairs that are 100% possibility. We wouldn't have bioceramic sealers, all this stuff. And um, so what, what, was the, what was the point I was going to make? I, I think the, the rate of change has continued to accelerate during my career. It continues to do that now. I think you're going to see a lot of new innovations coming out of the crisis for those companies that were able to innovate during that time. Mm -hmm. If you read business literature, they go that some of the biggest winners are the ones that go into creative mode when the market shut down. And so uh, we're going to see a lot of new stuff coming out in the next two years. It's going to be fun. Okay. And, and despite all of these changes, can you point to any um, foundational principles that haven't changed? Uh, despite all these updates and innovations in technology, what are some of the essentials that endodontists and dentists overall really still need to rely on? Okay, I understand the anatomy, mm -hmm. number one. Uh, the, the, the art of war says know the territory, right? That's mm -hmm. the first rule. That's in anatomy in dentistry, especially in endodontics. Um, stay up with material science. Um, uh, treatment plan your patients as if you really care about them and you're, they're a loved one in your family. If you do what you would want or you would want for your mom, you'll know what the right thing to do is every time. Mm -hmm. those, those are fundamentals. Treat your patients like yourself. Okay. You'd like to be treated. Do you have anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up then about um, looking back on your career or, or just how things are changing going into the future? Any other comments? Yeah, I just feel incredibly fortunate. We are all in one of the coolest areas of healthcare in, in the universe. and. Uh, we get, to, we get to change people's lives in a very positive way, save parts of their body, and almost nobody dies. Mm -hmm. So, and, uh, and the government isn't in charge of everything. So it's a awesome, it's a, it's a great life. And I hope uh, all my dental colleagues out there are enjoying it as much as I am. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your perspective with us today. And we look forward to continuing our relationship with you as an author for Dentistry Today for a long time to come. Thank you so much, Rich. Appreciate it. Have a great See you day. soon. Yep. All right, you too.